This is Jerry DiPiano, and you are listening or possibly viewing the Love Mia Vita podcast. Today, we have a frequently appearing guest, Dr. Juliana Hauser. And Dr. Juliana, welcome again to the Love Mia Vita podcast. Dr. Juliana is a psychologist who leads conversations about relationships, agency, sexuality, intimacy, and lots more. She is a PhD in counseling education, which she received from the College of William and Mary. She's also considered a thought leader and a sexpert who is diving deep into the hard to have conversations that all of us need to be having. And Dr. Juliana has spent decades counseling and supporting thousands of individuals and partners on their path to discover sexual agency, among other things, sexual intimacy, and fulfilling connections with others. The jewel of Dr. Juliana's offering is something called the Revealed Course. And you can find more information about Dr. Juliana and the programs that she offers by going on the web and finding her at Dr. Juliana. Dot com. And we'll put something in the notes at the end so that you can find her more easily. So Juliana, it's great to have you here with us again. And today we are going to have a conversation about a model that is a pretty sophisticated model, which we've, we've both been studying a bit. It's called the Differential Investment of Resources Model, which really is about building social relationships, and specifically about building those relationships into our mid and later adulthood. <clears throat> we, I don't think any of us underestimates the value of friendships and social connection. We need that support. We need stimulation. We need to feel a sense of belonging. And we, we know that by having those components, we establish a sense of well-being. Some of us get that from our family members, but we also need to think about how to broaden that. And as you know, relationships change over time, even family relationships. Sometimes those relationships aren't the healthiest relationships. And so we find ourselves looking for what's next, what's more, how do I still feel engaged and important and fulfilled in those relationships that don't necessarily involve kin, blood relations, but really are more about kinship. So let's talk about this, something called the Dyer model, which really is about these social relationships and specifically about friendships as life changes. Well, first, thank you for having me again. I always look forward to our um, conversations and I love the topics uh, that you want to get into. They are so important and they're often the ones that other people aren't having. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you know, it's inter so interesting. When I first started diving into um, the Dyer Method, um, at, at first it, it looks pretty intense. <laughs> you know, there's a diagram and there's lots of explanations. And then like, oh, similar to what you said, which is like, oh, sure, like I get this. And then I give it more time like, oh, this really... This, this really speaks to me and on, on several different levels. And one of which is I am, um, you know, being a therapist, I, I get to hear a lot of uh, stories behind the scenes. And one of the most surprising things, especially in my first few years of, of work was how many people have so much pain surrounding friendships. And it is not a topic that a lot of people speak about. And there's not a lot of support in it. And um, there are, I loved the explanation, uh, the um, example you gave um, earlier of another podcast guest that you've had speaking about friendships and looking at that. And I know that Bumble app has tried to do friendships and um, like how do we meet people? And for me, and we, I know that we've, we've discussed this previously that I, I really believe that connection is such, such an indicator of your quality of life. Um, and you really only need one person that you are deeply connected to in order to feel a sense of connection further. And, and to me, the reason why is because it's about affirming outside of yourself that you matter, that the fact that you're here matters. And 
some of us are blessed by having family that automatically and easily allows that to be the case. And it's not this catch all, like I have to, you have to matter because you're family, but like you matter. I'm lucky that you're mine. I'm lucky that you're in my family, but not all of us are blessed with that. And some of us have both that we have some family members that it's an ease filled thing and some that we don't. And so I was also really drawn to this model that it, it, it extended beyond family uh, and kinship. The word, that's the word that they're using. I find that to be a word that is not used enough in our vernacular and in our conversations. Um, so I got very excited uh, to dive into the concept of, of what this is. I, um, I also have had this in my personal life that uh, my first husband uh, is in the military. And so we moved seven times in seven years. And there was a, a very big difference in, he had an automatic, excuse me, he had an automatic support system set up with military. So he had a job that was lined up. He had people that welcomed him and they have a system that knew how to bring us into a community and into, into he was in the army uh, military community. So he didn't have as much of a curve as I did on uh, finding my network. And this was before the internet. This is before it was, much, you know, cell phones, frankly, like it was before really things were, um, uh, it was much easier than, it, than it, it was not as easy now to stay connected. So every time he moved, I had to rebuild my network over and over and over again. And this model would have really been validating because at the time I didn't have a lot of words except for it's just hard to start to try to find friends. That was as much as I could take it in the complexity of how I was feeling. But this model really helped me to see, oh, it is more than that. It was my dispersion of time. It was what resources I had. It was um, how, how was I feeling about myself and relating to all, all the other aspects of things and looking at it scientifically, even knowing that somebody thought the concept of connection mattered enough to study scientifically is validating that the experience of creating a social network for yourself um, is not easy. No, it's it's definitely not easy. And I, you know, I I can tell you that, you know, as as a maturing adult, I use that term, maturing adult, uh, who is in midlife, when you think about um, how your relationships start to change, and you think about the 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 idea of the finite amount of time that you have and how you choose to invest, we'll use the word investment, which is what this model contemplates, which is investing your time. It really is, it, it's important and it matters. And the thought of, okay, I, I work, I'm a CEO and, you know, I have a lot of networks. And then some of those, some of those networks which I would consider very weak, they're weak ties, right? So they're, you know, these are people I know, but they're not really friends. So they're weak ties. And working those weak ties requires a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Now, as we enter the middle phase of life, sometimes we still have a lot of energy, but it's where do you want to place that energy in the relationship? Because if it's a weak tie, is it really that satisfying? Mm -hmm. you know, yes, you can go and you have a glass of wine or maybe you grab lunch, but the weak tie doesn't really, it doesn't provide you with the kind of support and the kind of engagement that you really need. And perhaps that's because that person doesn't share, con aside from maybe some work experiences, they don't really share anything in common. And it, that, the model talks about that. Um, and again, it seems intuitive that this should be the case, but the model really validated my own feelings, which is that I really don't have hundreds of friends, you know, on Facebook, right? Everybody's so proud of the fact that thousands of friends, are they really friends? The people that really, that follow you, you have a handful of people that follow you on Facebook because they're the, the people that are really your close ties. And I guess you could expand that to, you know, people that we interact on a day-to-day -day basis with. So I thought that was kind of fascinating it's in terms of time, energy, who, what is satisfying? How does that really provide you with a sense of support? Because let's face it, there are a lot of people that you'd, you'd rather say, oh, thank God that that lunch was over. <laughs> yes. 
or or you just dread it completely because you know the amount of energy and resources is going to take from you in order to to have that connection or to keep up that connection. I um I I what another thing I like about this model is that it I think it does a great job of explaining why we're drawn to some connections and why we need different kinds of friends. Like for instance, when we, when we talked previous about divorce and um, and death and moving on from that and in, in, um, in, in other podcast topics, I had talked about we need to have, like I, I suggest that people have an advisory board and have different kinds of people in it. And when I then put the dire method onto the dispersion of that, I was like, ah, that's another example of why we need different kinds of people and taking it more into the, the model terminology. It's we, we have different needs of depth in our relationships based on where we are in our social networking and what you're saying too, like for the, for the relationships that they have, they meet a need, but they don't need the connective need. Um, those can be quite draining because they require so much more to show up and find the connection outside of a two minute, hello, how are you? Uh, here's this work thing uh, that we're going to talk about. That is very different than what it takes for the friend that is ease filled that you can show up at lunch, you are five minutes late and you've had a terrible day and you don't have to put on airs. Or you say things are fine and your friend says, no, it's not. I can tell like what, tell me, tell me what it is. And it's not to say one is more value than the other or that you can't change um, some of those relationships into something else. But to, to speak to your point that some of it seems obvious, but then it's actually really validating is we have a pressure on us uh, and, I, and I'll say this, particularly for women, women identified folks, to be friendly, to be open, to be connecting, to be people pleasing to everyone uh, that we come across. And I think this dire method allows us to be purposeful and intentional of who who we're putting our our time and resources into. You know, it's that's a very good point. We they talk about. Um, sort of different types of relationships that you have. And, and if you think about buckets of friendship, right? So there are those friends or the, these are your objectives. So maybe you need that emotional closeness and the emotional closeness, you know, that you can find with people that have affection that is shared, values and interests that are in common. Um, there's a reciprocity of support and we all we all should know those people, right? You hope you know those people. It's somebody that you you just shared this with us. That you're at lunch. You you know, you had a terrible day. You show up. You're smiling, but behind that smile, you feel like your heart's just been ripped out because something terrible has happened in your life, and your friend is there to support you. He or she doesn't really care about the fact that you're late or that you you know you're very you're very quiet. They just know. And so they're there to be supportive of you. But those, and those relationships can be easy. And that's the other thing that the dire methods speaks to. What is the ease of the relationship? Because that emotional closeness, when you have that emotional closeness, it's easy, but that also requires the reciprocity, that aspect of reciprocity. So when we think about friendships and sustaining friendships, they require both parties to invest in that time, in the shared values, in cult, it's cultivating. It's like your plant is gonna die if you don't water it, give it sunlight, right? And our relationships should be, we should think about our relationships in the same way, but we don't always have to have that type of relationships. We could have perhaps a less intense friendship with someone that, expands our social network that that gives us social capital that helps us to network maybe you want to join a country club and you need to have that social capital in order to be able to you know have the opportunity to join a club or to be part of a church group or a synagogue 
So there are different kinds of friendships. I guess it's a, you know, thinking about the strategies. We think through how you make friends. Mm -hmm. You almost have to die, put it on a diagram. What do you, what do you need, right? Yeah. What do you need? And then what are the things, the three or four things that you want to do in order to have those emotionally close friends, that social capital, and then those friends that kind of fall somewhere in between, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I took away from, from this. And then how much time do you actually have to invest? Because let's face it, if you're working or even if you're not working, but you have other you know, plans, you have, you know, maybe, maybe you have children that are adult children and they need you. We still, we all, our kids always need us, even when they're adults. <laughs> yep. I can attest to that too. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, I've got a couple of things I want, I wanted to say in response uh, to, to your comments. Um, I'll start with the plants. So I just say one of my best therapy sessions that I received was from a 19 year old who, uh, who was working behind the counter in one of my favorite plant shops. And I came in and I said, I kill absolutely everything that I buy in this store. I don't even know how many hundreds of dollars I've spent here. I love plants. I can't keep them. And so she asked me some more about what I'd done. And she's like, oh, you're just over loving them. And you're giving them too much time and attention. You need to either pick plants that like to be neglected or you need to learn to not over love. And it was, it, it was more profound than that. And I was having one of those profound days and it just hit me really differently. But I've come back to that very often. And it occurred to me when I was watching, when I was reading this um, article that, that that is also what we need to do when we're assessing our friendships. It's not just, it's not just what we need. It's also what that each friendship needs something different too. And we, it's, it's almost like when someone um, just makes a decision to breastfeed that they just think it's going to be natural, like and everyone can do it. And then if you're one of the ones that has a hard time doing it, they feel like a loss. A lot of people view friendships that way, that there's just supposed to be this ease and naturalness. And you're just supposed to know exactly how to make friends or how to keep friends or how to nurture them. But they're all so unique. This friendship needs this at this time in your life, but that same friendship may need something very different 20 years from now if they're still in your life. Um, or if, if you have five friends at this time, they all may need different things that friendships may need different things. And yet we don't talk about that. We talk about it in, 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 in much more broader terms of like, oh, this person drains me or this person needs too much, or I can't handle this, or, or, or it's superficial, that kind of thing. And, and I, what I love about this is it says, assess it, be purposeful and intentional. And, and for me, anytime something is talking about being purposeful, intentional, I pick up because I know that makes a very difference in the quality of how it's going to play out in your life. And as we've talked about in, um, um, as we're all aging and maturing, we do need different things and we have different resources and we have different parts in our lives that we can give and what we can't give, whether it's kids, uh, adult kids um, that need something or it's our own health, something has changed in our health um, or it's uh, we're going through something different and we need to be agile and and juke to what those needs are. Um, yesterday I released, uh, out into the world, my TEDx talk, and it's been so interesting seeing, especially since I've been really immersed in this model lately of, uh, how that, how that presented itself to the different kinds of people who are in my life. And, um, and it was different than I expected, which is at, which often happens when we're looking at our connections. There are people who I would probably put into the model of this, uh, into this model, uh, more work oriented and, and not as, uh, as someone that we put a lot of resources in, wrote me and knew all, like pretty much exactly what I would need to hear at this time, um, what it's like to be vulnerable in, the, in this place. Uh, and then there were some people who, uh, who, who were there with me. I tell this one personal story in it and didn't, didn't say the things that would have been ease filled with it. And that would have been really important for me to hear from somebody who, who knew me very personally. And, you know, I, I really thought about this model a lot and thought, I'm so grateful that I could be agile and look at things. It, it helped make things feel a lot less personal 
and it allowed for the ones that surprised me in a positive way to um, to really embrace that and feel grateful for the meaningfulness of that based on uh, the way that this model flat things out. You know, it's it may sound cold when I was uh, when I was reading and reflecting on this, and I thought, you know, you, it is the time to take stock of all the relationships, just as you had shared, and to think about, you know, which relationships are important in your life, which ones are less so important, and what each of those requires from you. Because let's face it, um, we talked about this before. Time is a key component in sustaining a relationship. So you have to give these relationships time. And perhaps 20 years ago, when you became friends with a group of individuals, you either did or didn't have the kind of time that was necessary to, to build on them, but you really enjoyed the relationship. Now, perhaps you have more time, but the person, the group of individuals that we're speaking of, you could put them in the bu that bucket, maybe they don't have time for you. So it could be that those same individuals now are grandparents or they are unwell because let's face it, it's not just time, it's time and energy and health plays a big role in determining both. If you're spending half your day going to doctor's appointments, you just don't have the time and you probably also don't have the energy because that might imply that you are not that well. So Yes, you may want to you may want to give support to those friends, but you just physically and emotionally don't have the the internal resources. So perhaps those change. Mm -hmm. And we do know, at least in the model reinforces this, that time is the best predictor of your friendship intensity. If you don't give it that intensity, it will probably your your friendship will start to wane. Doesn't mean that it will go away, but it's likely going to change. And then what happens is the closeness starts to evaporate, right? So things that you once had in common start to dissipate. And I and and I, so I think that that what you shared, um, pragmatically speaking, does make sense in terms of how we think about our relationships, what we need for each of those relationships, and whether we are capable, right? Whether we are capable of sustaining that relationship. And then that begs the question, do you abandon the, do you abandon that relationship? So how do you rekindle those kinds of friendships? Let's let's say that you do have a friend that, you know, you had that closeness, perhaps they are struggling with health and, you know, lack of time, but you really care about the relationship. What does that mean for you if you want to sustain the relationship? Mm -hmm. Yes. And and how does that look for each relationship that's in that? I have a, a dear friend that um, we've been friends for, for 30 years, um, but we've been long distance for the majority of it. So we have to make a lot of effort to see each other. And we're both busy with work and kids. And so even phone calls can be really difficult. And I have found that through the progression of technology, we've been able, to, it's it's eased us in being able, instead of instead of making it harder for us to be in touch, it's made it a lot easier for say, to, to stay in touch and have that intensity. But we've had to be able to redefine what intensity meant. When we lived 45 minutes away from each other, it's very different than living seven hours. And and what what we've done, and uh, again, I, I would look at the model to, that makes sense of it scientifically is we always ground ourselves and how how important our connection is for each other and that one of the things that we value about this is we have institutional knowledge of each other we don't have day-to-day -day anymore but we have institutional knowledge like the longevity of it and so we we continuously name that as a connecting thing that matters and then we know that we're a person you could call it two in the morning no matter what he's either come come with me like she jokes like you know help me bury the bodies or um, this terrible thing has happened and you're the only person that I can say this to. And that to me, even though, again, we don't have the day-to-day -day intensity anymore. And in fact, it's not even week to week. That meaningfulness of that connection is our intensity. And that makes for longevity and makes it difficult. Now we still will give each other grief if it's been too long and, and it will, our feelings have gotten hurt you know, for, with one another and we miss missing out on the day-to-day -day things. But 
that is something again that I'm not sure I would have actively been able to put concretely um, outside of seeing you know a model like this. And then there's people who get to be a part of the day to day life of things that don't have the uh, longevity, but the intensity is we have kids the same age. And so we are in the uh, the throes of scheduling and kid stuff and um, trying to figure out how to work out um, together, those kinds of things. And that's how we label intensity and find it. For, for me too, again, like I, I think what one of the biggest values of this article too is um, don't and neglect the connections in your life and don't get so tied to what those connections have to be and what they look like, but you have to have them. And they don't just happen naturally for most people in the, in the, in the length uh, and in the amount of connections that matter in it. Um, it is not going to just happen for most people and your health, your mental health, your um and even the longevity and quality of life makes is is directly correlated to connections you do have to make friendship a prior priority in your life and you know as we said it's it's a combination of time and energy and in close relationships just as the one that you described you have that, you, you probably have that longevity of the relationship. You have a closeness. It's based upon common values. It's based upon some shared experiences. And no, you don't have to see each other every day or face-to-face -face or otherwise to still know that you share that, that you have shared things with one another. There's also, you, you mentioned that you can say things to one another without feeling as though the friendship will, um, you will be disentangled or um, shunned by that person that they they refer to that as um regulatory effort <laughs> I mean, you know self-regulation and i and i call it disinhibition so when you're when you're permitted to say things that perhaps um may be inappropriate to say to someone in a casual friendship or with an, in a new relationship but in a in one of those close relationships the ease with which you communicate um, uh, gives you permission to say things that you may not otherwise say to the rest of the world. Because let's face it, um, we 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 don't want to um, come across as being socially inappropriate, politically incorrect. But with our very close friends, they forgive us for a lot of those things. So those are that that bucket really does give us that kind of opportunity. But we do need to think about as we mature in age, some of our friends will go away for various reasons. They may, they may move very far away, thousands of miles away to different continents even. And there are others that will, sadly, they will pass. And there are others that we will lose as we lose our relationships, maybe, you know, in divorce or perhaps in death. And it, it may be hard to sustain relationships that you formed as a couple or as partners, because it just feels, it feels bad. Um, and it, I, I say this particularly in couples where they're, they've undergone divorce, because let's face it, you know, your friends that you formed as couples may feel uncomfortable in the new relationship, or if you've moved on to form another relationship. So that requires you to rethink um, how you want to build those relationships. And it's going to take time and it's going to require you to do work. I mean, relationships and friendships just don't happen, as you pointed out. Um, and they also require more regulatory effort. So, you, you know, you have to be, you can't act like you're 16. You, you, have to, you have to behave like an adult. Put your big girl pants on, so to speak, right? And behave. Behave like a mature adult. And, and as a part of, of those two big life events, death and um, and divorce, that doesn't get spoken about very directly, that it needs to, that, you know, at, at a time where your resources are low and you're needing to put your energy into other places and, and you've lost a lot of your network, which is creates a lot of your self-worth and safety, it can be really exponentially catastrophic in, in the moment 
when you feel like a lot of your support and your network has dissipated because of one of these life events. And moving can be an, an extra part of this too, but with moving, it's pretty obvious you've lost uh, a lot of your network, but it's not as obvious in your di in divorce and, uh, and in death. But I, I wish it was more uh, that people could understand that this is an aspect too, and that when you have, when you're a friend to somebody who's going through that, that you directly talk about what your friendship means and you, and you, you seek out a difference in that reciprocity so that the intensity is, is, is allowed to have some movement um, and that the relationship can have agility to it. And we shouldn't forget that relationships may not happen. You may not form a friendship. So you don't stop trying. You know, you try something on, you know, I use an example in my own life where I was looking at my network and my network consisted of folks that I've known for a really long time who I love. We're very, we have a closeness. And then there are my work friends, some of whom, some of my colleagues have actually become my friends, which is also really cool. And, and that's one of the ways to make friends, by the way. So as your colleagues are no longer your colleagues, it's really common. You've shared a lot. Let's face it. We used to joke about having work wives, work husbands, and it, it, nothing sexual about it, but it, you share so much closeness during the course of the, the day that you, you naturally have that commonality, right? That can perhaps, not always, but perhaps can become a friendship. But so those are, you know, that's another opportunity for you. But let's face it. You, I joined a, I joined a group. I thought that I wanted to find this external group, and I believed that we had a lot in common. And after spending about six months, I'm sure they came to the same conclusion. They weren't too excited about me, <laughs> and I wasn't really excited about them. And nothing wrong with the group. I mean, they're very lovely individuals, but we just didn't click. So I didn't give up. Um, I looked for another group. And I think that that's important is to remember to keep trying. Don't give up if something doesn't feel right. Maybe you're philosophically on a different plane. Maybe they require too much of your emotional energy and you just don't have it because you're working or you have children or whatever, what have you, but don't give up. Um, and yeah, do find former colleagues that perhaps you enjoyed and they can become some of your friends. You know, the article describes um, four different types of networks, and I think that's what we were alluding to earlier. So we may want to spend a little bit of time thinking about, you know, how do we name those, those friendships and networks that may become important to us and may change over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and see them as uh, guiding posts instead of uh, that you have to have something in each of them, or there has to be a certain amount in each of them. And, and I, that was another big takeaway for me too, which is, this is, um, there's a, there's a lot of option if you can open up to creative ways of creating friendships and being in friendships. And like you said, like different networks in them. Um, the exact names are eluding me right now. Uh, do you have, do you have the four types in front of you? Oh, so the one that, the one that's most obvious, which is, you know, these are your, perhaps it could be a a large network. They refer to it as a smaller, close knit network, and it could consist of family members. You know, I'm from a family of five, and we used to be each other's best friends. But as we got older and we, you know, changed, maybe we're not on the same plane philosophically. It doesn't mean you don't love your family members, but your family or that what you thought was that real close knit group, the family, has changed. Again, the love doesn't go away, but maybe the, you know, the way in which you interact with one another does. So family is one. They talk about it as small. Then they talk about less close, which um, could be more diverse, right? A more diverse group of individuals, perhaps some what we just described, which is those that have the capacity to increase your social capital, right? Um, and then you have various types of friends and we they're in different buckets. So you have, you know, those that are friends of, you know, that you may have accumulated 20 years ago, right? 
and it could, could also be work friends. And you should try to dissect each of that. Again, it sounds very clinical. I don't mean it to sound clinical, but you know, think about who, who you really enjoyed. Maybe these were old college friends. And although you're friends on Facebook now, and you know, maybe you have a phone call now and again, you really enjoyed the relationship and you can see that you're still philosophically in the same place. So why not try to cultivate that or recultivate that? Try to go see them, you know, get on a plane and you know, if they live on the other side of the country, get on a plane and head out to the, you know, the Northwest and spend a little time, see if it clicks. And even though they may be, it may seem geographically undesirable, there's still travel, there's Zoom, you know, there's still ways in which you can continue to maintain or at least reestablish that relationship. And then there are just those, you know, that very low level of closeness. So that, that would be like the fourth level where you really don't have that kind of intensity, but it feels comfortable. It's fun. Maybe it's you know, your book club. Maybe you have friends in a book club or perhaps you take dance classes. So those are those are the four types that they describe. And they are all, you know, those are they build your network. And then you can kind of try those on. And what may start is the diverse group, the let the, the group that is less close. Maybe that ends up being the group that you gravitate towards more so than some of the others, and you start to establish those friendships. But I guess it requires trying a lot of this on. Mm -hmm. It's based upon your ability to have the time and the energy and the health to sustain yourself in those, because again, you will have to invest. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and keep in that investment, it is it's also an investment of continuously knowing who you are and knowing who, what you need, what you want and, and how that uh, interacts with other people, because you can, you can seek out connections with people in all these four parts, but it will feel unfulfilled if you're not showing up authentically to these connections and not feeling safe enough to show up authentically. And I think that can change like, that, you know, the family bucket is a complicated brew and it's for some, again, like we've talked about, like it's, it's ease filled and uh, it's, you either have a, a, a close people in your siblings or with a parent or two, or, um, or you have a huge network that of, of family members in one area. And so you always have family gatherings or you always know that it's, there's going to be, you know, this tradition. And the currency becomes the tradition of it rather than exactly what you have in your day-to-day -day life with each other. And it's, it's interesting because when, when I was uh, reading about social currency, my first reaction always is, and I use this word a lot, it's always like, ooh, there's kind of like an ick to social currency as if there's like a, a, a value to it. But, but if you're like my, me with my first reaction, uh, don't stay with just the ick. There, there is a lot of wisdom in what's, what we mean by social currency, what this article is meaning about social currency. Again, tied back to your health, tied back to your fulfillment and to tied back to the knowing of who you are. And, and you're absolutely right with these four buckets. When you look at them, it's not necessarily that the buckets aren't necessarily aha, but they're very smart. And, and there's a lot of wisdom of, you know, why reinvent the wheel too, uh, when it already is a lot to show up truthfully to the people that are easily in your circle. So look at the places that are, um, are finding that and, and that you're finding in that way. And one of the things that I tell people is when you're looking for friendships, which is a lot like dating, uh, you're just your end goal of what the relationship looks like is different is that you really want to tune into how your body feels when you're looking at these different people, when you're meeting these different people, whether it's a work person, whether it's a family member, whether it is uh, somebody that's in, in a, a friendship group, how, how does, how does your body react when you are connecting with them or what does it feel like after you leave them? And, and it's not, I don't mean five minutes after, I mean, literally as you're walking away, is it like, Oh my God. Or is it like, oh, it's great. I feel good. I feel, I feel good about life, about myself, even if it was a really difficult conversation or it wasn't the most fun filled experience. And, and I think that's another layer in the complexity of this model to get into, which is um, having in these friendships, having different layers of emotional intensity um, within these different buckets too. 
you know, I never really thought about it that quite that way, but it does make sense that in your gut, you know that that's a relationship or that's a friendship that feels good, or at least the interaction might be a new friendship or new, a person that you, you know, met and maybe spent a little bit of time, but every time you engage with that individual or individuals, you do feel like, yeah, you, you feel good about what just happened. Mm -hmm. And that can become the beginning of a relationship where it's easy, right? It's easy. You enjoy spending time, which again, it became, it becomes cyclical, right? You enjoy spending time with that individual because it's easy. You tend to want to invest more time. And as you invest more time, you nurture that relationship. And hopefully it's, it's reciprocal. Hopefully they walk away not feeling drained after having met you. And let's face it, we've all been in situations where for those of us that are hyper empaths, and I have been told that I am a hyper empath, you feel drained because you you may be on the receiving end and you're a psychologist. So you, <laughs> you know what that feels like sometimes, but it, it, it's your profession. So for you, it's, you, you signed up for this, but if you're in a friendship, if you're the one that's always on the, on the receiving end and you're not on the giving end, mm -hmm. you can feel pretty awful, right? If you're the one always take, you know, finding ways to, assuage someone's fears or you know listen to their problems and you get nothing back then maybe that's not a relationship that works for you maybe it's draining but you don't know until you try and, and sometimes it won't be perfect it's not going to be 50 50 some days it's going to be 150 percent on your part and you know the other party is given nothing and that's that's part of building the friendship um you know the the point of joining groups is is also important because you you will find if you find a group that um, where the interests are similar you love to dance you love to sing you want to be part of theater um, I have a friend a dear friend who um, had it, her own advertising agency New York ad agency uh, massive clients and she decided that she wanted to retire young 60 years old she decided that she was retiring. And she now does ballroom dancing. She got involved with a group and she is incredible. She's winning dance contests all over the United States. She looks magnificent. Mary Lou Quinlan, I'll just do a plug for you. Uh -huh. She looks magnificent. She's loving it. Um, and she met new friends. Mm -hmm. Not that she discarded her old friends, but she met new friends. She put herself out there. She's always been, you know, an actress. I mean, she was in college theater and so forth. But, um, you know, so there were some natural gifts there. But again, find your natural gifts. I think that's that's the bottom line. Showing up authentically. Showing up authentically the truth of who you are makes a big difference. Yeah. And what I have learned, too, is when you are in a place that's comfortable in your own skin, then that is what people are drawn to. And it makes makes those connections uh, come to you instead of you feeling like you have to work so much for it. And it, it, it can rule out the ones that it, it, it just, it's a really good barometer when you're showing up truthfully of who you are to a connection, whether it's a new one or an old one, then that's half of the work. What you're saying, like in, in monitoring your resources, if you, if you feel like you can't be who you are, that's automatically taking a chunk out of your energy and your resources in order to keep up with that relationship. And we all have to do that to some extent in, in some parts of our life, but you really want to have, when you're looking at all the, those four different places, which is why sometimes family is so tricky too, is that just because they're family, it doesn't mean that they get you that the same values or that you can show up truthfully of who you are. It just doesn't mean that. So it can feel like a drain in that way. But when you can make some choices outside of that, of who you're spending your time with, it should begin with knowing who you are and showing up second, showing up, up authentically as who you are and seeing who says yes. The, the visual that I give to it is like this. Like I kind of feel like this is like I put my hands over, over my, my chest and open them both up as like a soul. Like, do you want me? Uh, and you want to you don't want to be like, boop, boop, like too, too much. 
you want to open it up and the question is put out there. And when someone else says, yes, do you want me in that friendship? Then you get to have a more ease filled experience. And, and that's not to be confused with everything always being hunky dory, everything being uh, happy and ease filled in what the relationship is. And in fact, I believe that you have to have some discord. You have to have some kind of conflict to really also see the fullness because to me, beyond beneath all of this is safety. Connections that you feel safe in having conflict, safe in showing up truthfully, safe in sharing and safe in receiving. Um, those are the connections that I think this model is asking us to look for. Absolutely. And, you know, that doesn't mean that these are all, you know, that we talk about having diverse groups of friends, which is actually good because let's face it, as as we mature, we want to we want to stay on our toes. So it's 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 not inconceivable that there are going to be folks that you may make friends with that have a diverse set of opinion that come from a, a diverse background that could be very intellectually challenging and invigorating mm -hmm. as we mature. And you know, perhaps it's something we never thought about. Again, you're you're showing up authentically. It's not that you're a chameleon and you're going to change or they're going to change to conform to your beliefs or what have you, but you can show me you can have that mutual respect and that perhaps that the safety, which I think is really fundamentally important, as you just pointed out. Um, so it's not it's not inconceivable that those relationships might not also be kind of invigorating and 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 helpful as we mature and and think about you know what the next phase of life is going to look like for us. Um, and lastly, lastly, we talk about people who have had like best friends and. I don't know that it's necessary that we, I mean, think having a best friend is probably awesome. Uh, my husband happens to be my best friend. And I don't mean that in, you know, sort of a, a weird way. He just is. We've been married a long time and he just is my best friend. And I don't know that I'll have another best friend, male or female. I, I can't imagine that I will. Um, and if, if I am fortunate to have him Last, outlast me, which would be a good thing, <laughs> um, then I don't think he will either. But sometimes that if your your partner is your best friend and you lose your best friend, it's okay not to have another best friend. It really is okay not to have another best friend, whether it's because you divorced that person or they divorced you or they passed. Um, it's really okay. You can have closeness with other folks without naming them as best friends mm -hmm. and it's okay not to have a best friend at all too there's there's a you know i i again i kind of back to what i said in the very beginning which is i get to hear people's deepest fears and and sadness and and i'll have people ask me like is it is a friendship all that is cracked up to be is it is it is it are you supposed to have a best friend? All the movies, all the books. It sounds like if people talk about best friends all the time, and, and typically they're talking outside of their their spousal relationship, um, and or they'll say, "How come I don't have a best friend? Like, what is it about me that's made me not have that?" And I and I think we should um, I think we should take our fresh pressure off of that as well. And I don't think that we should you know really tie into the shoulds, but I do think that having so if your spouse is your best friend and you lose your spouse for, from whatever form then there needs to be something or someone that doesn't have to be the same but has a level of emotional intensity to it that um again can remind you that you matter and i think that's the biggest gift and loss uh with a best friend too and it could happen later in life so just a, a, one last little vignette, which is a true and accurate vignette. So my mom passed at the age of 90, two years, it'll be two years. And my father was really her best friend. Uh, they'd been married for over 50 years. Um, he died 12 years before um, she did. So left, like most, you know, mature adults, big house was too much. So she went into, um, and a, a living environment where she was with a lot of mature adults, you know, and all these people were new, it was out of her neighborhood with totally, totally new situation, new living environment, new 
individuals, males and females. So it was co-ed. I, I called it the co-ed dorm, although it's much bigger than a dormitory. And she had to start over making friends. And she did some of the things that we just suggested. She formed her own club. She participated in another club. She met with people and introduced herself and sat down to have dinner. And then some it, some folks she got along with and, and others she didn't. And over time, you know, she found her group. She found her friends. And then surprisingly, she found a very close friend who happened to be a woman who was, I want to say 20 years younger than she was. And they just clicked. And it all worked out. So it is, so the <clears throat> the good news is um, this woman was, you know, although she was two decades younger than my mom, they just had something in common, some shared purpose and established a closeness as she, she called her a sister. And so it is possible for us women to find our sisters, mm -hmm. even if they are not our biological sisters. So I loved, I love telling that story because it's number one, it's true. And number two, it's really a it's really something that creates hope. At least for me, it creates hope because I watched it in real time. Um, so Juliana, what are the three things we want to leave our listeners and viewers with mm -hmm. in this, as we talk about this very sophisticated model? It's a great model. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, for me, the, the three takeaways are uh, this, friendships are a very integral part of your health and your fulfillment uh, here on, on earth. And they're not always natural. So, and they're not always ease filled. And so it is absolutely worth the investment to put into it. Second is, is that um, it is so important and so worthy that there are absolutely measurable things that you can do in a way to look at creating networks in your life that can make a difference. There's not, there's not shoulds to it. There's just this, this is one of the ways in which you can look at in the wide range of people that you can come across how to do this and how to find friendships. And third is that again, like third for me in this, when I walked away from, from the article is you, you really need to assess what your resources are what level of intensity you're interested in when you are looking at friendships and that the social currency of connection is can't be understated enough all good points and throughout this podcast obviously there were many tips that we shared tips from our personal lives hopefully they will be beneficial Juliana is a, Dr. Juliana is a trained psychologist, and so she has counseled numerous individuals, so her wisdom is always greatly appreciated. Every time we have one of these podcasts, Juliana, I learned something new from you, Aww. so I, I very much appreciate it. I hope that you, our listeners and viewers, found this podcast on social networks, making uh, new friends as you mature in your next phase of life and the strategies, thinking about the strategies for doing so and some of the tips that um, have been tips that both of us have utilized both professionally and personally. Hopefully they'll, they'll work for you. And we hope that you will continue to listen in to the Love Mia Vita podcast, uh, especially uh, because Dr. Juliana will be a regular guest and we know that she has a diverse set of topics that uh, we will continue to share with you. So Dr. Juliana Hauser, thank you once again for being our guest on the Love Me Evita podcast. And for our listeners, thank you for tuning in. And remember to love Mia Vita. Music